William Lane Craig is capable of asking a good question. Such as this one, for example. So, what can we say about metaphysical naturalism? As a metaphysical naturalist, I frequently ask this question, both of myself and others. One thing I'd say about metaphysical naturalism is that it's viable. Craig, however, disagrees. Well, again, I want to make two points. First, my arguments for the existence of God show that metaphysical naturalism is not true. There is a personal, transcendent reality beyond the physical universe. The first Craig fail pops up at this point. Had Craig ever managed to present a cogent argument for the existence of a supreme creator deity, naturalism would indeed be false. But he hasn't, so naturalism might well be true. Therefore, despite Craig's considerable huffing and puffing over the years, reasonable people remain at liberty to be sceptical about the existence of a personal, transcendent reality beyond the physical universe. Either Craig fails to realise this, or he hopes that his audience will fail to realise it. Nevertheless, Craig moves on to his second point. But secondly, I think that metaphysical naturalism is so contrary to reason and experience as to be absurd. Craig develops this point by introducing no less than eight arguments which he claims demonstrate the absurdity of metaphysical naturalism. These ad absurdum arguments address issues of intentionality, meaning, truth, moral praise and blame, freedom, purpose, endurance and personal existence. Craig claims that the first premise of each argument is taken from Rosenberg's 2011 book The Atheist's Guide to Reality. And in the following arguments, the first premise in every case is taken from Dr. Rosenberg's own book. The form of these arguments is one in which Craig first presents a conditional attributed to Rosenberg in which a necessary condition for the truth of naturalism is given. According to Dr. Rosenberg, if naturalism is true, I cannot think about anything. According to Dr. Rosenberg, if naturalism is true, no sentence has any meaning. According to Dr. Rosenberg, if naturalism is true, there are no true sentences. According to Dr. Rosenberg, if naturalism is true, then I am not morally praiseworthy or blameworthy for any of my actions. According to Dr. Rosenberg, if naturalism is true, I do not do anything freely. According to Dr. Rosenberg, if naturalism is true, I do not plan to do anything. According to Dr. Rosenberg, if naturalism is true, I do not endure for two moments of time. According to Dr. Rosenberg, if naturalism is true, I do not exist. Then, with a rhetorical air of exasperation, Craig exclaims the common sense absurdity of each of these supposedly necessary conditions. I am thinking about naturalism. Premise one has meaning. We all understood it. Premise one is true. That's what the naturalist believes and asserts. I am morally praiseworthy and blameworthy for at least some of my actions. I can freely agree or disagree with premise one. I planned to come to tonight's debate. That's why I'm here. I have been sitting here for more than a minute. I do exist. I know this as certainly as I know anything. From which he concludes, Therefore, naturalism is not True. There are three additional Craig fails here, each granting us further license to ignore his anti-naturalist conclusion. Counting the initial hubris about his arguments for God, the second Craig fail is that a true claim may well seem absurd to those who hold a conceited common sense understanding of the prima facie evidence. Imagine, for example, one of Craig's predecessors persecuting a 17th century materialist who denied the existence of an immaterial life force, that is, who denied the church-sponsored doctrine of vitalism. A devout inquisitor could well have used the following ad absurdum to dismiss the claims of the materialist heretic. According to this misguided soul, vitalism is false and thus everything is dead. And yet, here we are, alive to hear his heretical ramblings. And presumably, he was alive when he wrote them. Clearly, therefore, vitalism is false. This is a stupid argument, which no intelligent, educated person in the 21st century can take seriously. 
However, Craig urges us to take arguments of this kind seriously when he uses them against Rosenberg's naturalism. Either Craig fails to realise that rhetorical scoffing in defence of a received common-sense worldview is no argument against the philosophical consequences of empirical research, or he hopes his audience will fail to realise it. The next Craig fail is that Craig seems to draw a conclusion about naturalism in general from particular views voiced by Rosenberg in a single volume. Rosenberg, however, does not speak for all naturalists in that book, nor does he claim to. With regards to Craig's argument from intentionality, for example, Rosenberg would admit that there are naturalists, such as Dan Dennett and myself, who disagree with the wholesale semantic elimination of mental aboutness he presents in Chapter 8, and who admit that, at least at some higher level of the ontological hierarchy posited by our best empirical theories, relations of mental aboutness can be meaningfully discussed. In making his conclusion about metaphysical naturalism in general, then, Craig either fails to realise that Rosenberg's voice is one amongst a variety of metaphysical naturalists, or he hopes that his audience will fail to realise it. The final Craig fail gives the lie to Craig's supposedly accurate citation of Rosenberg. Regarding Craig's argument from meaning, for example, there are plausible philosophical positions, consistent with naturalism, wherein the meaning of a statement need not rest on mental aboutness. That is, wherein a doxactic attitude need not be intentional to its propositional extension in order to confer meaning upon its utterance. Meaning as use theories, for example. I happen to know from personal correspondence that Rosenberg is well aware of this. And so I find Craig's claim that Rosenberg asserts that naturalism denies all semantic meaning suspicious. Indeed, the only point at which Rosenberg could conceivably be read as saying anything of the sort is on page 160, where he talks about our ancestors falsely holding that marks and noises have meanings that were in their heads. But even here, his use of the term meaning could be a pro of purpose in life, which is how Rosenberg consistently uses the term throughout the remainder of the book, and from which he signals no particular deviation. Craig, however, trades on this ambiguity in attributing the first premise of his own argument from meaning to Rosenberg. So whilst Rosenberg's words on page 151 are They, thoughts, aren't about anything. That goes for every sentence in this book. It's not about anything. We find Craig interpreting this as And he says that all the sentences in his own book are in fact meaningless. Matters deteriorate further in Craig's argument from truth. For nowhere in his book does Rosenberg claim, as does Craig's premise, that naturalism denies that there are true sentences. Given these ambiguities and inventions, either Craig or his research minions have failed to read Rosenberg with due diligence and charity, or he doesn't expect that his audience will or can read Rosenberg that way. In this video, I have demonstrated four instances where Craig has displayed either incompetence or dishonesty and at which the cogency of his argument against metaphysical naturalism is thereby cast into doubt. Therefore, despite Craig's quick-fire rhetoric, or whoever is deemed to have won a piece of theatre masquerading as a debate, rational people remain at liberty to assert the viability of metaphysical naturalism. Thank you for listening.